Okay, so today's lecture is on transhumanism. Uh, last time I talked about a, a Christian uh, approach or towards a Christian literary theory, and I didn't get far enough to my own satisfaction to uh, present it as it was, uh, in part because I need to um, account for what's going to happen in this lecture, what I'm going to discuss in this lecture, and what I we'll discuss in the next, next lecture, which is on post-humanism. And um, the uh, challenge of a Christian approach to literary theory is uh, the main challenges come from transhumanism and post-humanism, in my opinion. Um, and they are not as they are popularly being presented right now in the academy from postmodernism which you will hear in Christian circles and in conservative circles, that the challenges are from postmodernism. And you'll hear Jordan Peterson railing against postmodernism and, um, and the ills that have come from the academy, and you'll hear me do the same thing. Um, but that's very much old hat because uh, postmodernism stopped being a thing in the academy, as in lit theory, uh, almost 25 years ago. So that's how far out of date the conservatives are and the evangelicals are and Christians are in terms of engaging with the culture. Um, so when I say stop being a thing, it's being talked about in popular uh, venues, like on conservative websites. They'll talk about postmodernism and they'll get a lot of traction because it explains the total irrationalism they see all around them because postmodernism is committed to an attack on meaning, an attack on reason, attacking on normativity, an attack on colonialism, all the things that I've cataloged thus far. Uh, those are there and they remain there and they remain catch-all phrases. So colonialism is the catch-all for whiteness and European and um, toxic masculinity. Colonialism probably pulls all those things along with it. And uh, it, it suspends appeals to reason and ideas of reason debate and let's look at the evidence and so forth. The colonialism and what I talked about when I talked about critical race theory really does dispute the idea that we can reason our way forward and come to a better understanding collectively because the sides have been positioned such that the uh, very appeal to reason is uh, call, considered a power move uh, according to an illegitimate criteria and, uh, and is on the playing field of the establishment, at least the establishment of the past. And Foucault very much supported that when he talked about a different episteme a and the episteme that he wanted to prom promote was uh, that which would flip the script, as it were, and um, stop assuming that the establishment view of human nature uh, was actually valid when, when in Foucault's opinion, it arose in the 19th century. And he, he discussed that, discusses that in The Order of Things and The Archaeology of Knowledge and elsewhere. It's in his work on the uh, development of the prison, discipline and punishment, it's in his history of sexuality, where he talks about the idea of heterosexuality as opposed to homosexuality, homosexuality which only is a term in the mid-19th century. So he talks about all of these things as recent consequences of the human sciences, which are uh, not only questionable, but are solely based around power and oppression. And as I said to you when I talked about Foucault, uh, Foucault has an inordinate influence in the academy. But that would just push, put him in the postmodernist camp and, um, and not really account for s something that we see that has been influential in the academy for the last 25 years. As I say, nobody talks about postmodernism in the academy. Nobody. Only in conservative circles do they talk about it as if this what were the problem when uh, if you're on the cutting edge of this in the universities, you, you're seeing that nobody's talking about it. What are they talking about? Well, they are talking about inter intersectionalities. 
for sure, in the education square, very much so. Um, and inclusion and diversity and you know tolerance and those sorts of things. And they do have the pantheistic consequences that I've talked about already. They uh, effectively, if you include everything as mere information, then you can't differentiate good and evil. Uh, the very concepts of good and evil are rational distinctions, linguistic distinctions that words um, lack the uh, ability to actually grasp and are effectively meaningless. They are themselves a power play. So we move from a black and white to a 50 shades of gray uh, approach and all shades of grayness are good and we get varieties of different human identities that arise from that. Uh, from that context. This is not a problem of postmodernism, however. It's a problem of transhumanism. Because transhumanism is a project uh, that has a, a, genuine, a genuine project that it's trying to achieve. Whereas I would say that all of the varieties of lit theory that I talked about that characterize the 20th century, uh, lit theories in general, are anti-humanist. That's what I said describe them. They're anti-humanist. They dispute that there is such a thing as human nature and they're opposed to it. And they do it through identity group approaches. They do it through attacks on the word, being at war with the word. Uh, we looked at the R.V. Young's work there. So they either attack the person or they attack the word uh, as their general approach, but that's not what we confront now. We see a very positive agenda being rolled out for us. The negative doesn't go away. They will still use those uh, forms of attack against their opponents. So they'll attack the idea of human nature. They'll attack human reasoning, etc. And those are, are uh, I admit, postmodernists in their flavor. Uh, but the positive agenda is represented by transhumanism and transhumanism, I'm going to take, it's going to take me some time to get into this and show you the consequences of it. But let me talk about the consequences a little bit more specifically and then I'll come back to them and at, at which point I think it'll make more sense. But the consequences of transhumanism uh, are to dispute the moral nature of humanity and the idea that freedom is important to human nature. Those two things. And transhumanists are in the target sites of C.S. Lewis in his science fiction work. They're in the, um, it's there in the abolition of man in chapter three, where he talks about the abolition of man, he's talking about the transhumanists. It's there in that hideous strength. Uh, it's actually even before that, but specifically in that hideous strength, when he is talking about the NICE and its agenda for gaining control over human nature. It's a project that is in the university uh, of his day, and it's there from a variety of vantage points. There are scientists there, there are religious figures, there are uh, capitalists on board. There are um, politicians. There are propagandists, newspaper writers. There are sociologists. Mark Studdick has been brought in on board because he's a very good writer. He doesn't care. They don't care about his sociology. They care about his writing skills because he's on board uh, with them, broadly speaking, in their view of human nature, which, which is a view of human nature of the human sciences. Not the humanities, the human sciences. His wife, on the other hand, very interestingly, is a humanities scholar doing a, doing a dissertation, a PhD, on love. So there's a, there's a war between the humanities and the human sciences within the very marriage there. And, uh, and Mark is being pulled away from her, that is his wife, by the NICE. Uh, but Lewis is talking about the, the challenge or the threat of transhumanism there in his work. Um, and what Lewis notes about this project, and it is interesting, and it's also true of transhumanism in, of our day, uh, 
he writes that the serious magical endeavor and the serious scientific endeavor are twins. Now, it sounds a little strange because when you think of science, you think of the realm of the rational, the skeptical, the objective, whereas magic is the remain of, of the dogmatic, the credulous, the superstitious. It's what um, the rationalist atheists accuse Christians of. You're just appealing to myths and stories and so forth. So in what sense does Lewis connect magic with science and particularly transhumanism? Well, we can see it, that it, it runs through it a number of Lewis's works, first of all. Uh, Uncle Andrew in uh, The uh, Magician's Nephew is a magician and a scientist. Uh, the conspirators in the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, the NICE, in that hideous strength, they crave the powers of science and magic. They want Merlin. They are desperate to get Merlin on their side. And the purpose of this is to re-engineer society. And there are three important ways, and I'm getting this from John G. West, uh, the Discovery Institute, in his sort of summary of this, three ways in which they're similar. The first one is that they can function as an alternative religion. Both science and magic inspire wonder and mystery and awe. They have that in common. And scientism, those who are scientistic in the sense that they believe in science as a sal salvational branch, as it were, we can trust the science, believe in science, uh, have something like reverence and awe and also prohibitions against questioning or thinking or criticizing the science, which we saw very much uh, laid out for us under COVID. You must not, you know, do you, don't you believe in science? And it wasn't a, uh, a rational position, it was how dare you question. So how dare you think scientifically about science, <laughs> ask for evidence and proof and rationality and so forth. Um, so that's the, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that uh, it, it offers a, a powerful alternative to traditional religion. And the promoter par excellence for this was H.G. Wells, which uh, for those of you who did the sci-fi sub-creation course with me, which most of you did, um, Wells and others fashioned Darwin's theory of evolution into a cosmic creation story. And Lewis called this variously, depending on the work, he called it the scientific outlook or evolutionism. He mentions that in the discarded image at the, at the end. Uh, the myth of evolution, he even called it Wellsianity. Um, and uh, he, what he notes here, which most evolutionists deny, is that uh, Darwinian theory really presents a great story. And it's the story of a fight to the very end against the inevitability of destruction. It's a sort of thing that you see in Norse mythology as well. The Goethe Dämmerung at the end of all things. There'll, ultimately, there'll be a, str a struggle. And at the end, we will lose. Catastrophically, there will be a destruction of all things. That is there implicit in evolutionism, because remember, it's a survival of the fittest and all that. And, and Lewis thinks that actually this is a far more glorious uh, narrative than you might think. It has a great deal of explanatory power uh, to many people. And uh, in, the, in a bleak and uncaring universe, the hero appears by chance on a signif insignificant planet to be fighting against astronomical odds and everything seems to be against the infant hero of the drama and yet in the end he fights the fight and in the end he loses however but still that struggle of that is uh, magnificent and he climbs his way that is humanity to the top of the animal kingdom and he's going to go one step higher and become like the gods and at that point it fails. Now, let me add one final thing on that note. 
The word transhumanism is used for the first time in 1957 by Julian Huxley. And Huxley saw it as man remaining man, but transcending himself. And I'm quoting here, by realizing new possibilities of and for his human nature. So Julian Huxley, who was the uh, head of UNESCO, brother of Aldous Huxley, was a, an advocate of eugenics as a, a way of planning and plotting and controlling human evolution. And a friend of his was H.G. Wells. Now, H.G. Wells writes a work in 1923, uh, a novel called Men Like Gods. And he imagines in the future a benevolent scientist, uh, benevolent scientist technicians who will use science and technology to manufacture a perfect future, a perfect future. And though this, so the scene is set for an approach within the human sciences to attain the good, not in a platonic or a religious or a properly humanist understanding, but as a practical extension of the capacities of that human beings have in their will and in their purposes as an extension of their capabilities, understood in a materialist sense. So augmenting our physical strength or augmenting our life, the span of our lives. And that is very much uh, being researched, studied, and promoted in the uh, universities of our day and has been for a very long time. So if you want to look up transhumanism, look at Silicon Valley and the universities in California, the elite universities in Stanford and Berkeley and you name it. You can find them in Oxford and Cambridge as well. You can find them in Europe. You can find them at the University of Toronto. Uh, the transhumanist project, uh, which can be also be advanced through AI, incidentally. If you want to know why, why all the money uh, and talk is being pushed into the AI is because AI is seen as an extension of the human, augmenting our capacities, extending them, making us be able to think uh, at, a more, at a more rapid and powerful and evolved state. And this is the threat of AI, say the humanists of AI, is that it, its capacities so far exceed ours that we're dispensable. It's all there. It's, it's all there. For AI, really yeah. What I'm saying is so evident, self-evident, and it's, it's in the public square. It has been for quite a while now. Now there's almost nothing but it. And yet the conservatives and the evangelicals and whoever you want to name, whatever they fits under that conservative umbrella, don't talk about it as a problem. And that's because they're on board with it. Because they don't, they, they share the same view more or less of the, of the human, sadly. And we're gonna have to come back to that view of the human, um, which is at stake here uh, in, in the whole transhumanist project. But transhumanists seek approach to the good. And I says I say, not in a platonic sense, like we saw last semester, not in a religious sense, and not even in a properly humanist sense at all, but as an extension simply of material capacities. And this is the application of science to human nature. And it, it's a long-standing project, but it really, I think, uh, at least C.S. Lewis argues in his lecture, De Descriptione Temporum, which I read in our Lewis class. And I'll do it again next year when I do C.S. Lewis again in his inaugural or his maiden lecture at Cambridge University, when he's talking about uh, the ages of literature or looking at it in terms of ages uh, or time periods, because his chair is that he's, they've given him in Cambridge is medieval and Renaissance literature. And normally these are discrete areas and they don't mix at all. And in that lecture, he disputes that there isn't more continuity between the medieval and the Renaissance period than discontinuity and, and, and engages in all this. So then he, he's just looking at it and questioning the, the boundaries within literature there. 
And he says the real shift goes, uh, comes uh, in uh, twice. We go from the pagan era to the Christian era. There's a shift there and it's genuine and it's significant. But there's a great deal of continuity there. There's still a sense of human nature, a rational human being. Um, the pursuit of the good, the life of the mind, the life of the body politic, which we can see in the classical age, that continues on, carries on, even by Christians. And so the question, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, is largely answered by the Christian tradition. It has a great deal to do with it, but that doesn't mean that the classical age is correct. We need to, as Augustine says, we need to plunder the Egyptians, and that will include the classical, our classical forebears, the Greeks and the Romans. We need to Christianize their thought. Uh, we don't need to reject it altogether. So there, and there's a continuity there that goes, but there is a significant shift there, and particularly in what they mean by the good life. And, and furthermore, the end of human life, because in a Christian conception, we're made for God. We're, we're not polytheists, and we're made for glory. And the weight of glory presses upon us and changes because of the incarnation, it transforms our view of human nature and the end of human nature, which is to be one with God. Um, and that's a, but there's a significant shift there. There's another shift, and he says it's not between the medieval and the Renaissance. And you can re revisit his lecture if you want. I'm just summarizing it. It's in the mid 19th century when he says Darwinism starts monkeying with the origins of man and Freud with the soul of man, and uh, but in general, we turn the view of science against human nature for the first time. We apply it to human nature. Now he says that's in the mid 19th century. Uh, on my course, I have suggested that actually that project begins back in the earlier 18th century when we start looking at language. Although he's correct about man but he's not correct about language, and those two components are key here. It begins as a study of language, the origin of language, the origin of language and theories of language moving from emotive cries to articulated sounds and being able to reason about it. That begins in the early 18th century, and I, in my view, that's the beginning of evolutionism. It's evolutionism in language, evolutionism in uh, reasoning, which then eventually gives way to a biological theory under Darwin in the mid-19th century. Lewis is correct insofar as he says that in the scientific realm, that's when a shift takes place. He's not correct insofar as it happens a century before in the area of language. So there, here's one, one area where I, I disagree with Mr. Lewis, and he would agree with me if I pointed this to him. I'm quite sure. I think he would. Um, but in the mid 19th century, we look at human beings as something to be experimented on, to gain power over. And at that point, we dispense with the whole humanities tradition because we, we dispense with the idea that man bears the image of God, has a certain sanctity and dignity that we can't mess with, that we must not uh, treat as if it were an object or an animal or any, any material object. Um, to a shift where we see man as merely the sum total of his capacities and functions in a very materialistic fashion. And what we do as a consequence of that is we dispense with the idea of human dignity, which even the pagans held. The, human be the, the pagans thought that human beings had dignity. Um, in the, uh, the Odyssey, one of Odysseus's companions has gone unburied, and he has to go back and bury him before they're allowed to carry on. Um, when Achilles slays Hector and he drags him three, round, three times around the walls of Troy, even the gods are outraged at the treatment of, of a man here who's a hero. Why are they outraged? It's a funny thing, because they don't have the idea of the inherent dignity of human nature. It's that um, in both cases, there's a sense of the sacred there, however. And Achilles is, is really threatening the gods with his 
sense that there's no value in anything except for his greatness. And, and in the end, it's actually the pleadings of, of Priam that uh, sway Achilles to move away. And he says that here is great heroism in front of me, this man who lies at my feet, weeps and pleads for his son, comes right in the middle of the enemy camp at risk of his own life, and, uh, and Adi Achilles lets him go. It's a, it's a huge, significant moment. All I'm trying to say with this is the pagans have a sense of human dignity as well. And that's the purpose of the cross, is precisely because it humiliates. It doesn't just kill. It's a, it's, it's a slow, it's a slow act in killing thing. Yeah, okay. But it's way more than that. It's to humiliate. And the Jews were crucified naked because the Jews never went naked. Wouldn't bother the Greeks so much or the Romans, but boy, does it ever bother the Jews. So we're going to add that here. The Jews will be crucified naked. Christ is crucified naked to humiliate him, to remove his dignity from him. And God permits this, which is another aspect of the cross, which is extraordinary. But in both cases, there's a sense of human dignity. In the pagan age, which they're trying to uh, violate, the Romans are trying to violate that through the cross, and, um, and the Christians will double down on and apply to everyone everywhere, not just Roman citizens will have dignity, but every human being bears the image of God. Not just your family, but strangers, children, women, slaves. These have human dignities. Why? Because they bear the image of God. Come the mid 19th century, there's a shift there when we look at human beings as something that we can study objectively, dispassionately, and as if the, the dignity of the person doesn't matter. Because all we're looking at is an animal that's evolved. That's all we're looking at, a more evolved form of animal. So all you need to get to uh, agreement on this project is simply their consent, their informed consent, to be subject to the experiment, the Nuremberg Code, right? That was the sole remaining uh, ethical code that was recognized by the transhumanists until COVID hit, at which point they waived it, just like the Nazis did. Um, the most uh, alarming aspect of COVID-19 was, was that, that they had a code which th they ridiculously enforced over the most silly, trivial experiments in, in psychology, they ask you to fill out a form if you answer a questionnaire and it's being tabulated for data, you have to still sign your approval that you're being experimented on and we have a research and ethics committee that will make sure that they follow certain guidelines. So it's very, taken very seriously under COVID, informed consent, just gone. No university defended it. Um, medical scientists, med uh, medical professionals, doctors, scientists, whatever, looked the other way. It was not informed, it was coerced, and consent was uh, not even required because they didn't believe in human freedom either. So, and one final note on this, which I think is important as a just pulling into the whole framework here, is that B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist psychologist, wrote a work, and I'll pull, pull it up here, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. He writes this work. Ha! That's not going to work. There you go, you see it there anyway. Um, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, in which he argues that the ideas of freedom and dignity are part of the humanist tradition, and we need to dispense with them because they stand in the way of a planned society and the manufacturing of a perfect future by means of science and technology. And he says that the chief defender of the tradition of freedom and dignity is none other than C.S. Lewis. In his works, he promotes the idea of human freedom as being important and human dignity as being something that must not be violated or we forfeit the human altogether. 
And so he is targeted for this, and, and rightly so. I think he's correct in doing that. He could have added Tolkien to it, by the way, who does the same thing. But, but Lewis does so far more robustly and consistently and repeatedly in all his works. And against them is amassed the transhumanists. And as I say, it's, only, it's first used by Julian Hus Huxley in the UNESCO movement. But you can see it uh, back in H.G. Wells and, and in science fiction, which, again, Lewis engages with in his sci-fi trilogy. But even in the early stages, we can see a mechanistic worldview rooted in the assumption that mere or more technology would solve humanity's problems and allow humanity to transcend itself. And despite not, not speaking with one voice, transhumanists are united in their focus on biotechnological enhancement and a uh, techno-utopia of human-machine fusion that constitutes practical immortality. They're, they're committed to this. And the reason why is because they have a certain view of human nature for which freedom and dignity are impediments. They're impediments to this project, holding on to this. So how do you advance a transhumanist agenda in education, in lit theory? First of all, you have to get people to question human nature. And secondly, you have to rob them or erode their sense of human dignity. And so when I said that when I, I wanted to do a Christian approach to literary theory, you have to, enhance, you have to um, emphasize the two things that are in the target hairs here. You have to promote a literature that has an understanding of human freedom and, and a, a view of human slavery and fights for the one and fights against the other and likewise of human dignity. That needs to be there in the literature that you have read in the schools. But the second thing, and it's at, at least as important, is the attack on human dignity. And that happens two ways. One that, again, the conservative and Christian community fully recognizes, which is in the uh, experiments on human beings or the degradation of human life, which we see in euthanasia and abortion, Th those things. So, or maybe I should flip it the other way, and abortion and euthanasia. And I think that it's important that both are happening, by the way, because what, what those express is that is a control over human life at the beginning and at the end. That's, that's why they are there. And if you control it at the beginning and the end, and then that's considered ethical or scientifically possible or permissible or politically desirable, then you're, what you're doing is furthering a transhumanist agenda, which is against freedom and dignity. So politics gets interwoven with the educational project. So that's the frontal assault, which everybody recognizes. And either you agree with that as a bad thing, or you don't agree with it. But you see that there's an assault on human nature there. But there's a second way in which uh, human dignity and freedom is assaulted. And that's the educational way. And it's not just in talking about abortion and euthanasia in schools. It's through a different way, which is actually through this, the um, categorizing of, of all knowledge as simply information. And here I wish I had my book with me, but I'll see if I can find the title here. And I'll just put it up on the screen. I must have left it at home. I carry it around. I actually have multiple copies, but there you go. Oh. Technopoly, the surrender of culture to technology. That's not the book that I have. I had that last year because you recommended it. Good. Ah, uh, it's too small to be of use there. Uh, do I got images? There I have. There you go.
The approach of Technopoly, the gist of it, the summary, very briefly, is that culture, which is the cultivation of human nature through education, and is part of the Dominion Mandate. Remember the Dominion Mandate in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And I'll throw it up here. Not Colossians 1, as much as I love that. Go to Genesis 1 and so many pop-ups, which I super hate. Go away. There we go. Then God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the three realms that he's talked about in Genesis 1 to 3, the sea, the land, the air, dominion over all those things. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, the individual, male and female, he created them. The family, very important too. There's plurality in the Godhead as well as a consequence, a sort of as many theologians have observed here. And the male and the female, uh, part of being the image of God as well. These are not negotiable categories. They're not um, subjective to literary theories, strange views of language and so forth. And God blessed them and God said to them, and here's the dominion mandate, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over and everything. Okay, but, and then I said to you, I think it was last time that in the Genesis one narrative, God begins by uh, subduing and then filling. So he subdues the elements, he separates them, he differentiates them, and then he fills them. Human beings do the exact opposite. It's a mirror image. They fill it and they subdue it thereby. Because by having children, you are able to cover the earth with people and the people will use nature to glorify God in the right way. You're to make it better. That's part of the demand date. It's not it's not dominate, it's not destroy, it's not regarded as a material thing, it's a regard to regard it as God's handiwork and to treat it so, especially human beings. That's the dominion mandate and uh, absolutely essential to this. But when it comes to information then, and here's the problem in education, is that education has lost all sight of the importance of freedom and dignity. These two things have been lost sight of because they've lost the sense of human nature containing freedom and dignity, which is part of being made in the image of God. What does that mean exactly? What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that the moral nature of man is no longer a goal of the education establishment. So. The goal of education, as far as I'm concerned, or what education is, is it's training in wisdom and virtue. This is not an equal, but I'll put an equal here anyway. Training It's, it's implicit in the uh, Shema in Deuteronomy 6. The whole of Deuteronomy, but really there, Shema, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. You shall teach this to your children. You'll put it on the frontlets of your eyes and on your hands and on your doorposts and on the city gates. So it occupies your thoughts, it occupies your deeds, the things you do with your hands. So the intellectual life, the active life, if you will, the vita contemplativa, the vita activa, it governs the domestic sphere, it governs the civic sphere, the polis. That's what I think. So it's very holistic and it comprehends the whole of the ancient world's sense of wisdom and paideia. 
there coming from a Hebrew text. And if you want further corroboration of that, well then look to Ephesians 6 verse 4, where it talks about the paideia and euthesia, and the word paideia at this point has, which he says, in, he cites in Greek, has these holistic connotations of the Deuteronomy 6 uh, injunction to uh, parents to educate their children. But what you are doing them is training them in wisdom and virtue. You're teaching them what it, it means to be wise and good. The moral life is, in other words, in, in, in play or intended. You're treating them, your neighbor well. You're treating, you have a certain view of property. You have a certain view of dominion. You have a certain view of the law. You have a certain view of foreign relations. You have a certain view of everything. That comes directly from scripture. And from the wisdom that is contained in scripture and passed on. That's not just information. Wisdom is not information. Wisdom is a understanding of information. Whereas the modern educational approach is to regard all information as equal. It's just data points. They see it materialistically. And if they do it, then a computer is better than we are because it processes at much, much faster speeds in greater quantities and has a much greater, not only processing power, but a, a database as, which is seemingly infinite and you can put it up on the internet. So when I ask people for an answer to a question, they do a Google search for me and say the answer is this because that's what the, the number of hits pushed it up the categories. But is that the discernment of wisdom or knowledge that they actually have? Or is there any virtue in the process? No, so we are, we're being pushed to uh, worship power of information processing. And therefore we trust AI when it comes to scientific or moral or political problems, we go to the data and the sport, sporting world does the same thing. It uses computer modeling to make athletes better at what they do. It's in all the sporting world. It's in the educational world that the, again, they want, they'll want data. So if I try to give this talk to most people in the corporate world, they want evidence. By the evidence, they want data, they want models, etc. These are people who've been captured by the mentality of technopoly and, have no li and, and don't understand the assault on wisdom and virtue that is inherent in the appeal to data to corroborate. And so it does it two ways. One, it doesn't train in wisdom and virtue. These are no longer on the wish list even of educators. And secondly, it does it by assaulting. So it can just throw information at you, just raw data dump. And then you prove that you're a good student by being able to memorize huge quantities of data, not differentiating it, not making any qualitative distinctions, but sheer quantity. If you're really good at that, then you're a good student, except that you aren't, but, but that will give you success. Right? But that will give you success if you're a really good memorizer and you can regurgitate. And if, if the education establishment teaches to the test, so they teach kids to pass tests, then you can get people to get in the 90s if they're really good at memorization and they can simply regurgitate it. They don't have to think about it. There's no moral involvement. There's no discernment process. There's no uh, development of the inner person. There's no, there's no reflection on the law of the Lord which is like honey and sweet. There's no sense of grace. The seven uh, virtues recognized in the church of the, uh, the four cardinal virtues and three theolo th theological virtues gone from the consideration. But more than that, there's a secondary assault within the overload of information and that is the ways in which we ask kids to degrade themselves. And that's done chiefly through entertainment, in which they show people degrading themselves in what they call reality television. So the ritual is, you're a prisoner in a, in, on the TV show, you're effectively within the experimental conditions of whatever the show is, survivor or 
I don't even know what. They have so many different variations on this. Used to be one called Big Brother in the UK, in which you're watching people in real time over a great length of time talk, and there's a, they're, they're trying to win the show. And how they win, will they get pe people to vote for them or against them? With them? And they can do it through duplicitous means. Same thing with survival. It's Darwinian survival that is the end. And these people who are celebrities participating in it, whether they were before or after, if you're a celebrity and you go on one of these, um, then you get a little bit of people watching you. But you can also be a nobody and be, go on it and become a celebrity through it. But what you will do is degrade yourself in public. Your privacy will be gone. And with privacy, your inherent freedom and dignity. That there's parts of my life that nobody should see, intrude upon the realm of it. In those shows, there is no privacy. And they will show people at their worst. Same thing for Game of Thrones, by the way, which is an assault on freedom and dignity. It, the whole purpose of that show is to make a mockery of the idea of human dignity or the life of virtue uh, or any sense of the importance of human freedom. And people love it because it reinforces their own views of themselves, which is sordid and degrading and certainly not exalting and certainly not uplifting the way education traditionally would be. So transhumanism, I want to push it in that direction. It, 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 you can do it through information or you can do it through degradation from below. And the degradation is very important, by the way. Almost more than overflowing you with information and ignoring that you have to carefully select what you're teaching the kids and just instead do a big data dump is the idea that you degrade them along the way. You get them to agree to things that they don't want to do it for a reward to win the game. How do you win Survivor? You are a total, prince, you're a person without principle or morality. That's how you win. Survival of the fittest. What it reinforces is a Darwinian view of human nature, a materialist view of human nature. It says that moral considerations are not there and should be no part of people acting in real life. People learn by imitation. They see what's happening in these reality TV shows. So that's the way it is. And they want to be that way because everybody wants to win. And the winning means you win the prize. You win some money, whatever. You win the girl because the dating games are the exact same thing. It's just Darwinianism. You know, we got 30 beautiful girls. You have this one guy and they're all trying to get his attention and whatever. Win the, how do you win the show? Well, you get him to pick you. How do you get him to pick you? I think you know how you get him to pick you. <laughs> yeah. And you degrade yourself in the process. That's not just the people there that are participating in this, like prisoners in a game that they've agreed to, by the way, they've consented to this and their dignity forfeit in front of everyone else, humiliating themselves. But we watching it think that this is the way life actually is and they act accordingly. This is education as well. So the degradation angle of education is coming through the media mostly, but it's even in the schools and the way they do games. So you can flood them with information or you can degrade them and both are ways of attacking freedom and dignity. Comments or questions at this point? I've thrown a lot all at once. If not, I carry on. So let's talk about the definition of transhumanism. Well, I talked a little bit about this already, but let me just give one that's off Wikipedia. It's a bad place to get it. But transhumanism, and it has an abbreviation, either a, capital H plus or H plus, whether it's capital or lowercase, is an international intellectual movement that aims to transform the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technology to greatly enhance human intellect and physiology. Yes, but power. Intellect. Intellect is a power. It's not the same as wisdom. Intellectual power, a computer with its chip, it has greater intellect in that pure sense of processing. It cannot make evaluative judgments. And it certainly can't, if it can in some ways just by training, it can never make the wise decisions because wisdom comes from God himself. 
Christ's wisdom is not the world's wisdom. It's also not even the pagan world's wisdom, the wise Socrates. No computer is going to lead you to that position. So transhumanism, I'm trying to make a case that this has been promoted in the academy for decades, and it has. And to show you this almost, I don't even have to talk about it in the academy. I can do that as well and talk about the individuals that have been promoting it for a while. And those are just the heads of the institutions. But, but popularly, it's been promoted for decades. Postmodernism is just uh, is a, is an assault on the tradition, but it's not replacing it. This is the replacement. The context is the eugenics movement, which is a predecessor to transhumanism. And it was responsible for the inhuman treatment of humans, not only in Nazi Germany, which were condemned at Nuremberg, and then the Nuremberg Code came up, but also in advanced democracies, the ones that everyone thinks are uh, above the pale. It was in the US, it was in Canada, it was in Scandinavia. Uh, it was in uh, Great Britain because Huxley's a Brit, part of the establishment, part of the UN. And if you look at just briefly at the 20th century in the development of the nuclear bomb, well, I just watched Oppenheimer's uh, the film on Oppenheimer, good film in some ways, although it puts sexual degradation in it for no purpose to advance the plot of the film whatsoever, uh, but it does get you Academy Awards because they want to see degradation in movies. That's the only reason I can see it. It serves no function in the movie whatsoever, um, but it makes it an adult movie at that point. Oh, well, well, if it's adult, then we can take it seriously and we can give you awards. And also then you're on board with transhumanism because they believe in degradation as well. Um, but the nuclear bomb, the biological weapons, maybe COVID virus, if there is such a thing, which is disputable because they've never isolated it. Um, uh, but there certainly are biological weapons. Uh, mass murder uh, through uh, science and technology uh, in atheist regimes throughout the 20th century, in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union for that matter. Uh, they, those things suggest that for every benevolent use of science, governments and scientists funded by them did, uh, they will also find uses that are of clear and present danger to everyone. And I don't think that stops being the case. So the legacy of the eugenics movement, which was condemned as a war crime after Second World War, uh, has given way to a techno, uh, th because the advent of the computer, a more perfect way of advancing this, a uh, more intrusive one. It can come into your home through your device, the device that listens to you and watches you if they want. You can, what you're watching is, can also watch you, is also listening to you. You know that's how these things function. And it can have as much of a hostile view towards human, humanity than others. So let me put it theologically. Transhumanism is, in a sense, a revisitation of the Genesis uh, temptation. You should be as, as gods, knowing good and evil. No, I want Genesis, and I want three. Serpent said, the woman did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. The woman said, we may eat of any of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So it's an extension of knowledge. And it's a knowledge now that determines good and evil, now that a moral dimension. You're going to determine that. You're going to put yourself beyond that. You're going to consider it just a form of information. And you're extending it. Now, in the popular conception, this encounter in the garden is just called eating from the tree of knowledge. 
That's all they say it is. And God's forbidding them to have knowledge. Not true. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, first point. Secondly, it's the serpent that says, that suggests that these are the only thing that prevent us. The impediment from being as gods is to determine good and evil as information like all the rest. That's also in transhumanism. Same basic temptation. All we need to do is use biotechnology to make ourselves stronger, smarter, less prone to violence. By the way, they will also say that's, that we can do it ethically. When people get angry or violent or tended to violent, we can watch them and see when their faces contort, when they're angry at things. We can intervene in a sort of a pre-crime way, being talked about right now, you know, thought crime. We can get them. Uh, before they do these things and we can intervene to prevent violence from occurring um, and we can extend human life indefinitely. Why is that wrong? Why is that a, something that the human sciences ought not to do? Why not? Does it not sound good? Who doesn't want to live longer, healthier, stronger, faster, and less prone to violence. Who would not want that? So that's the challenge of transhumanism. I've suggested the way in which it's promoted in the education establishment already. So it's not just a lit theory, it's an approach to education. It comes from an overflow of information, a glut, and an overflow of degradation. The sex ed curriculum just being one form of it, but it's more popularly uh, presented in pop culture. Remember, Game of Thrones begins with incest, which is a taboo that goes far beyond, as far back as human civilization, and presents it as, okay, it happened. Are they going to die for it? Are the gods going to be angry? Is there going to be punishment for it? No, not really. Um, and that's the assault of transhumanism in our day. I'll get to posthumanism next time. But it's a reduction of human nature to a material object with a uh, mechanistic worldview, that of the, enlight the Enlightenment. So and it's an extension of that. And in general, um, it is the dominant view. And, and going back to the Genesis 1, when it talks about exercising dominion over the earth, when it says, the animals, the birds, and the fish, it doesn't say man. We are not included under the dominion mandate. However, cultivating ourselves is implicit in it, and we're to cultivate it ourselves in the image of God. That is Deuteronomy 6. That is Ephesians 6 verse 4. That's what cultivation, that's what dominion over yourself means. It doesn't mean domination. You don't treat yourself as an object, you treat yourself as an image bearer of God, etc. What's a better way of looking at human nature than? Now here I want to go to a book. Uh, where have I, where did I put that book? There it is, which I started the class with. Let me erase this because it's muddying up the screen and it's extremely small and I apologize for that. And I cannot even make it larger, I don't think. I don't think I can or maybe can I? I can, that's a little larger. Can you even see that still? If you can, I still can't do anything about it. I tried to before the class began. This is from Oliver O'Donovan's uh, wonderful book, Begotten or Made, which I have uh, cited at numerous points. Um, and it's, an, it's a lecture uh, that he ended up writing up, but he wrote it first in 1984. But it's just as relevant uh, then or today as it was when he first wrote it, I think other than that some of the examples have changed, but the basic thrust of his work has not changed. And he's going to address this in ways that I think is important here. Um, um, and where do I want to go with this? Uh, but we, see, we need to see this in terms of, first of all, um, in terms of the project of education. 
which is, as Augustine says, well, he doesn't say this, but it's eschatological. Education is there to fulfill our human nature made in God's image. We're made for glory. It has a purpose that goes even beyond death. There's a long view. It's not confined to the pattern of this world. It's not confined to the extension of physical human life. It's for a perfect life, which is a moral life, and it's made in the image of God. And it will be connected to the significance of history to a person's identity as well. Augustine makes, and I said this last time, Augustine makes very clear in his own writings by including the confessions in his writings that his personal biography, his coming to faith, his conversion narrative uh, is an important part of his human nature. History doesn't matter to the transhumanists at all because life is meaningless. It, the, the living of a life, the events of a person's life are meaningless. Survival is the only meaningful thing and they don't even know what survival is there for other than not to die. But there's no significance attached to death other than the sense that life ends at it and therefore we want to get rid of that. This is the postulate of Weston, by the way. He sees the, the, um, the evil of death and that's all he sees. But he's, Augustine recognized the significance of history to a person's identity, and unlike many classical writers, most famously Aristotle, he didn't, he didn't actually write a treatise on the soul as well. And this is actually interesting. He didn't write a treatise on the soul, but he did write, his key work is on the Trinity. By the way, he does write one work on, on the soul's beginnings. Um, but why? in order to recognize events like birth and death and resurrection. That's the purpose, not to recognize the soul as opposed to the body the way Aristotle does, the mind or the soul body dualism. It's not for that reason, it's because of the historical uh, connecting personhood to providence, which Augustine has in view when he talks about education. Remember, last semester we talked about this De Doctrina Christiana, education, he begins with things that are useful and things that are, what is it? Enjoyed. To be delighted in. And there's only one thing to be delighted in or enjoyed, and that is God. And everything is a journey towards God. And there is a moral journey. It's a journey, it's not a journey considered in a flat direction, it's a journey upwards. You see, there's an ascent. It's not the flat information, there's an ascent, and you can't do the ascent without reading the scriptures, because that's how you understand God, and you become up, you, you, you elevate your character. And so he talks about um, attaining certain virtues along the way as well, which then Dante lays out in the uh, uh, Purgatorio as he ascends. Uh, but the way that O'Donovan addresses this, I think really helpful with respect to personhood, is there in the Nicene Creed, and it's in terms of begetting. Let me read this paragraph to you. I'm gonna start here. I can't actually even highlight it. So right here though, where the arrow is pointed. When we speak of a person, we speak of a persona, and it is well known that the, that term had special associations with the ancient theater, where the persona was the character mask. Everyone wore a mask in the ancient theater. Tragedy, comedy, wore a mask. You didn't see the face. We speak, therefore, of an appearance. It is the appearance of an individual human being. The Greek equivalent means simply face. Persona is a face. It's interesting that in the Eastern philosophy, we talk about saving face. Let me go away from that stupid aside. But in invoking the theater, we also invoke the thought that what is presented there is not a tableau, but a story. It's not just information. It's not just a narrative. It's a story, and the story has significance. 
the personae dramatis, like we have in Shakespeare's plays, laid out right at the beginning, are not mere faces, but characters who have their exits and their entrances, whose appearances and reappearances constitute the drama. In the ancient theater, one actor might often play more than one part, and one part might be split between two actors, because of course you can wear the mask, it doesn't matter. The intelligibility, the intelligibility of the drama, therefore, depended on the continuity of the mask, so that the spectators would recognize not simply the reappearance of the actor, but the reappearance of the character. The actor's not the character. Here we do method acting. People get into the character and they identify with the character, but the character is a fixed type. Oedipus is wearing a mask. He has, he's got tears on his face and whatever before the event happens. We already know from the mask. It's not a blank mask. It expresses something about his character throughout from the beginning to the end. We already know the story of Oedipus, that's not the point. A persona is an individual appearance that has continuity throughout a story. It is the appearance of an agent to whom things happen and who does things, of one who has, as we say, a history. Now what's the comparison? Compare a human being to an animal. Compare this to a Darwinian view. If we look at a herd of cattle in a field, we can pick out individual cows from the mass, yes. But no cow has a history in the sense that an individual human being does, which is to say that although cattle, like human beings, live individuated lives, which are extended through time, there is no particular significance which resides in the individual life course of each. It does not constitute a story. When Abraham entertained the three heavenly visitors by his tent at Mamre, he slaughtered a calf. Has anyone ever asked, which calf? <laughs> Yet, you could not slaughter a human being without slaughtering some particular human being, without someone with a name of whom it would make sense to ask, who was it that died? You wouldn't ask that question of a cow, but you would of a person. Who, who died? Even if you slaughtered hundreds of thousands of human beings at one blow with a strategic nuclear weapon, people whose names you will never know and whose faces you will never have seen, it will still be the case that they had names and stories that the history of some Dimitri or some Anna has been brought suddenly and irreplaceably to an end and that that unique event has happened hundreds of thousands of times in one moment. Individual humanity does not lose its significance when it is part of a multitude. Rather, the history of a multitude gains its significance from the fact that it is a multitude of persons, not of ants, each of whom has a significant history in him or herself. This is the dignity of a human being. To speak of a person, then, is to speak of an identity, that which constitutes sameness between one appearance and another and makes us beings with histories and names. It was inevitable that this category should appear more satisfactory to Christian thinkers than the purely qualitative categories with which the ancient classical philosophy had undertaken to analyze man, like having a soul. Yeah, but this is an individual st soul with a story. Didn't matter in ancient philosophy. Yes, but it does in the Christian story. This is a huge advance. Augustine points us to that. Let me go down further on this. I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, I know that I have another page, and here it is. Uh, since I'm out of time. I'll put this uh, on our course website, the three pages that I've copied from O'Donovan here. We can understand how patristic Christian thought, it, developing as it did in two main languages, Latin and Greek, was able to use interchangeably two words which had different nuances. The Latin-speaking church spoke of a persona, a term with its association in the theater and the law courts, which suggested that the person was an agent, one who could appear or hold a part in the public realm, the Greek-speaking church came more slowly to speak of a hypostasis, literally a substance, something standing underneath, a substance, the, uh, which suggests a reality what, that which underlies or supports all the characteristics and qualities, all the variable appearances which one and the same person might represent. Now, what is the substance? The substance is the moral life. 
that you can't see. It's not, a, it's not something you see on the surface. It's the substance. It lies underneath. But what lies underneath, underneath is what's going to elevate you to be more in the image and likeness of God. We might most helpfully re render hypostasis as subject. The difference of emphasis in these two terms caused problems of mutual understanding. But the common element was the emphasis on continuity and historicity in both cases. The significance of a human life. A human life has dignity. Human life is free and therefore it can act in a way that's different than the rest of the individuals. It's not a herd animal. An individual human life matters and every human life that you read about in the stories that you read that are worth passing on will say that there's something significant about this individual that you're reading about. They have a history that you know about but they also have an individuality which was uniquely pushed in the direction of, of excellence, of moral excellence, of worthiness. And this is the life of wisdom and virtue that you should follow. I think those things are important. Uh, there's other important elements on the final page that I copied for you here. And this is the classical definition of Boethius. And I'll, I will conclude with this. The landmark which most conveniently shows how lessons learned from the debate about Christ were appropriated for human identity in general is the famous definition of Boethius' fifth tractate with which every philosophical article on the concept of person begins. A person is the individual substance of rational nature. For Boethius, defending the Chalcedonian definition of Christ, two natures, without confusion, etc., as one person and two natures, it was paramount that the concepts of person and nature should be kept distinct. Now we have a nature, but we don't Nobody speaks of persons. We have human nature. They keep them distinct. Why? A person is a substance, and a nature is the specific property of a substance. It is not the case, as supposed by Heretux on all sides, that to every nature there corresponds a person. Animals have natures. They don't have persons. It's only human beings have persons like God. In other words, the distinct qualities of humanity are attributable to persons, not persons to the qualities of humanity. Yet there are amb ambiguities left unresolved. It is still a criterion for personhood that its nature should be rational. When Boethius' substantialist understanding or his Aristotelian presentation of it was eroded and his Christological basis forgotten, it became possible to read his words in another way as though a person were merely the particular instance of a rational nature as if reason defined us. Particular instance of reasoning. That's the Enlightenment definition. It is depersonalized. The history of the concept person is the history of how nature takes over from substance, the secondary feature of the, the definition replacing the primary one. So how is that then going to relate to education? Well, sort of, obviously, it's going to exalt the significance of when we're talking about human dignity of personhood as opposed to nature. It's anti-Darwinist, anti-reductionist, etc., etc. I've overshot my time, but you got a gist of it.